Welcome to the Physique Development Muscle Series. In this special series, we're breaking down the science and art of training each muscle group. Each episode is dedicated to a specific muscle, providing you with expert insight into its function, dispelling common training misconceptions, and highlighting our go-to exercises that deliver results. We'll also share key execution cues to help you perfect your technique and maximize your gains. Get ready to elevate your training game and achieve your fitness goals like never before. Let's dive into lats. Today was almost my second time ever wearing makeup. What was the first time? <laughs> well, before we get into the first time, the second time was because I've got this shiner on my nose. I, I am blessed to not have facial acne all that much, but when I get facial acne, it's like very painful singular zits. I don't love that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I was planning to hide that or I had asked you to potentially hide it. We didn't go through with it. My very first time wearing makeup, I've never told you this before. I, we'll see. We'll find out. My very first time wearing makeup was I had showered in my parents' bathroom. I was like seven or eight years old and I had seen my mom's razor and I was curious of how sharp the razor was. And so I took it to my head hair and I thought I was just going to like take off a layer of my hair. I mean, having zero understanding of how hair works, I thought I was going to take off like a layer of my hair and I took the, the, <laughs> the razor and took it like straight down the middle of my head and it cut all of my hair off. And I was so freaked out because I literally went down and then all I saw was my scalp. It cut all of my hair. And my mom was so angry. <laughs> Just like, why would that be your decision? I don't know. It was a, it was a moment of weakness. Obviously, it wasn't really a, a great decision to be made. So when how did you wear makeup? For so that? then my mom colored in that area on my head to the color of my hair every day before school, <laughs> and she was she did it every single day. So that was the only time I've worn makeup outside of that. So I guess I wore it multiple times because it was until my hair grew back. How much hair did you take out? Like I mean, it was like it was a the square size of a razor yeah the middle of my head enough to just have like one streak yeah but was it like the streak pulled forward or just like right where you put the razor well it was far enough to where i realized that i had cut my hair out like by the time i saw the my scalp i was like oh, i have to stop <laughs> <laughs> All right, then. All right. What an <laughs> opener. <laughs> I'm so perplexed. Me too. In hindsight, I don't really understand why I did it. <laughs> but let's get into something that we can understand <laughs> a little bit more. Yeah. And today we're talking about lats. Lats are an interesting one and a very complex one. They at, are complex. The it's one that I feel like I hear often that people don't know how to hit or feel their lats. Oh, well, I think it's you know fair to be said because it's one of those muscles that we can't see in a mirror, which mm -hmm. I, I do think has a, a vital role in just our mind to muscle connection to some degree, um, as well as I've said already the complexity and we'll get into the insertion and the origin and all that fun stuff to really dive into why it is so complex. All right. Well, then let's let's start diving in. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Let's talk about the function or what the muscle does. Okay, so the function of the muscle is going to pull the upper arm down, which I think is a little bit misunderstood. I think that many times we're, we're thinking that it's going to be acting upon the shoulder joint. And so it's just like protracting and retraction of the upper, upper back or the scapula specifically. There is going to be portion of the scapula that is going to be an origin for the lat, but the lat itself is going to be acting upon the upper arm. That's very interesting. And I remember when I first found that out and like learned that it was a mind blown emoji type of feeling. Yeah. And it felt like it also connected a lot of dots for me on how to train my lats. Yes. And from a function perspective, it's going to be extension of the arm as well as adduction of the arm. So adduction meaning that it's pulling closer to the body. And then the extension is I would be pushing my arm back behind me, if you will. I think that that's the best verbal <laughs> way of <laughs> explaining extension of the arm. Now you've talked about one part of an origin being in your scapula, does that mean that there's multiple origins to the lat? There is. Uh, the lat is massive. Uh, the lat is going to be 
extending from, I would say, if I was to put a percentage, I would call it two thirds of your back is going to be covered by your lats. And <clears throat> with the origins, I have a, a little bit of a uh, analogy, I okay. suppose, that I could walk you through that I think will be the easiest for everyone to be on the same page. And I did forget to note one uh, function of the lat. And this will kind of tie into how we go through the origin and the insertion specifically. But it is going to medially rotate the upper arm. So again, pull the arm or rotate towards your body with that upper arm. So that's one thing I forgot to note. But for the origin and the assertion, I want you to close your eyes. Now, if you're driving and listening to this, I want you <laughs> to save this still. for later. <laughs> <laughs> save this analogy for later. But close your eyes and imagine that we have a rope. Okay. And we're going to take one end of that rope and place that on the front of our upper arm. I want you to take that rope and, and let it run under your armpit towards your rib cage, and then let that rope guide towards your spine. Now, this is a very special rope because it's not going to have just one end and another. We're actually going to have the one end that we just placed on the front end of our arm. And then we're going to have five ends that come off of this rope. Are you visualizing this? I'm, I'm visualizing Do you see it. How I crazy see this rope, rope looks. It's just, <laughs> it's like my arm and then my fingers coming out. Bingo, bingo. Rope. That's a great one. Thank you. So, the first place that we're going to see the lat originate is going to be on the inferior portion of the scapula or the bottom portion of the scapula. And so, that's going to be our first spot, which is going to be. I'm going to call that like the, if we're looking at your back, we're going to call this like the, if we were to put it into four squares, right? Equal spaces. We're going to put it towards the lower portion of the right upper square. Okay. okay. Then we're going to have another portion of this that is going to attach to the vertebrae. This is going to be more towards the middle of the back. This is our second point. We're going to have a third point that is going to originate on the third or fourth rib. I'm going to take the next portion of this rope and take it all the way down to the hip. Now, if you are someone who played football growing up, you had a son who played football, whatever the case may be, those hip pads, you remember the shape of those where they, they kind of, um, I don't know what to call it, the, the shape of those hip pads, it's going to be on the back of that hip, if you will. And then the last one is going to be connected to the fascia. Now, what in the world is the fascia? Uh, the fascia is a special wrapping inside our body that holds everything together. Think of, of the fascia as a supportive web for the muscle fibers to attach to and move against. So this is not going to be directly attaching to a particular bone structure, but to the specific fascia. And that fascia is going to be the uh, th thoracolumbar fascia. And so that's going to be more towards the middle lower portion of your back of where that fascia is going to run from. And so do you, can you visualize the five points that that rope is attaching to from your arm? Yes. Okay. I did. I went through so many iterations of this. Should I open my eyes? You can open your eyes okay. now. <laughs> I went through so many different iterations of trying to make this as simple as possible without oversimplifying it to leave things out. Mm -hmm. And I felt that the rope analogy was kind of the easiest way to guide through the story of how it would work through anatomy. So would you say that the lat is like fan shaped? I would say the lat is, is fan shaped. Yes. Okay. That's helpful. Yeah. It's fan shaped. There's there's so much to it. The fibers are going to run in different directions. You have some that are going to run more horizontally. You're going to have some that run more at a 45 degree angle. And then you're going to have some that run more vertically. Very interesting. And that was helpful to be able to visualize of what it looks like for how it does all attach. Because I think that when it comes to muscles, and if you don't know the anatomy, like I didn't know years ago, then you just kind of have these general concepts of what a muscle is. And the more that I've learned about where things originate and where things insert. Again, I don't have everything memorized of all of the very long words and like body structures that happen with it. But even just being able to picture generally where things are gives me such a better way to be able to move the muscles in my body because I understand it. And I'm not just saying my lat's on my back. So I guess I'm going to do this movement that someone says is a lat movement. It's like, okay, I can visualize 
what it looks like sweeping along my back and what movement I need to make to ensure that I'm hitting it. And that helps a ton with that mind muscle connection as well. Yeah. And I think that it also helps by understanding the origin and the insertion, it allows for you to better understand how to perform the exercise. Or if you only have a specific amount of equipment, how can we line things up to best target this muscle tissue that I'm trying to train? Now, I think another really helpful thing other than being able to visually see, which we will have a cheat sheet that you can go ahead and download to be able to have that visual, uh, but being able to see how the lat works, not just in the gym, but when it comes to -to day-to-day life of what is being used for that. So do you have some examples of just daily activities that you'd be using the lats in? So many things. I think that uh, pulling anything, lifting things uh, are going to be important. Like um, moving furniture, I think is a really easy one. Picking up uh, groceries, trying to be the the one trip <laughs> <laughs> person of getting all your groceries in one trip. Like your lats are going to be a big part of stabilizing and also picking those groceries up. Mm-hmm. I also like to think of like, if you're using the banister to pull yourself upstairs or to like walk up the stairs, your lat is going to be involved in that. Or even just using like the armrest to like pull yourself off a chair. I think that uh, swimming, swimming is a huge one. Uh, if you feel like you struggle with swimming, I would say that your lats are not you know, I, should, I shouldn't just equate it down to <laughs> lat strength, but your lats are going to be certainly a contributing part of your ability to swim. And I think that something always worth mentioning of how it goes within our breathing, because we do need to breathe to live. And so lats help within your chest and being able to expand to be able to breathe. Carrying a backpack or a purse being able to stabilize with the core and maintain posture. I find that to be something for literally everybody. At some point you're carrying a backpack, at some point you're carrying a purse. So this is something where the lats are gonna be a helpful hand, you know, depending on the heaviness of the purse, right? Mm -hmm. It may not be a ton, (laughs) but I see some of those tote bags. I see how full some of those tote bags are, as well as moms who are lugging around all kinds of baby stuff. Mm -hmm. Lats are gonna be a helpful hand. Low reps is best. High reps is best. Fruit is so it's good. It's terrible. You, you should lift heavy. High reps. Carbs low are weight. needed. Keto squats are bad for your Squats needs. are great. You for should your squat ass for grass. Toes. It's fine. It fits my macros. It's for idiots. When there are so many mixed messages going around, it's hard to know what you should even do or focus on. But that's exactly where physique development one-on-one coaching comes in. You might have heard of online coaching or even hired a coach before, but we believe in teaching you the why behind what we do while truly taking your life into consideration. We want to train, educate, and empower you to reach your goals and help you to stop spinning your wheels and just finally feel good. And hey, we're here to help you look good too. You need you. Your health is your wealth. So join Physique Development and let us be the last coach you ever need. So when it comes down to visually what things look like, what are some things that you'll notice? So it's going to give you more of a a tapered look. And that may be something of like, what in the world does that mean? Mm -hmm. But if we think about it being tapered, it's like we have a wider shoulder than what we have to our waist. And the taper is the muscle leading down to the waist. And so by building our lats, you're going to also see that your waist will appear smaller. And um, if you have childbearing hips like myself, (laughs) <laughs> building your lats is going to be a helpful hand in giving you more shape and symmetry to your upper body. Mm-hmm. Especially because there are some people who just genetically have very small waist of like people who are walking around with 22, 23, 24 inch waist, which is just very, very small. But there are going to people be people that have waists that are 27, 28, 29, 30 and above. And being able to really work on that lat does allow for you to kind of fake that shape a little bit. And I have personally, if I'm not going to say like a 27 is a big waist size, but that is what my waist size is. And it's obviously not a 21. And it's something where people have told me before of like, oh, your waist is so tiny. And I kind of chuckle to myself a little bit because I'm like, it's not tiny, but uh, I've created the illusion of it being tiny by being able to to build up my lats and have the shape and structure to my body in that way. Mm -hmm. Is there anything it's going to do for your clothes and how they fit? I would say it's going to change how your clothes fit for sure, especially for you guys with sports brawls. Mm -hmm. I bet that that changes the sports brawl sizing for you a bunch. Do you want to speak to that? I do, because I think that a lot of times 
I mean, just in general, women are very attached to their clothing size. And I've had to do a lot of work myself to like not be attached to a certain clothing size. And I remember one time I was doing a try on or talking about a bra that I had and talking about how I had lat spill. And somebody had messaged me and said that they had just always looked at it as back fat. And I have always had to get a larger size in sports bras or normal bras because of my lats and or your rib cage. People of different sizes rib cage, but that can play a big role in it. And it's not meaning like, oh, you, you're so big, you need this bigger size. It can just be of, hey, I have more muscle there, so I might need a different size for it to fit me better. Um, so I think that that definitely goes in. And even just I had got a dress for Valentine's Day that I had to end up returning because the size in and of itself fit me, but when it got to zipping it all the way to the top, my lats were like squeezed into it the, to the pack that I could not breathe. And I was like, this one's going to go back to where it came from. <laughs> Do you have an example of how much you have to size up in the sports brawls? I mean, it's going to depend on how much muscle you have and how it fits you in general, what your actual cup size is. Like, do you have an A chest comparatively to a D chest? That's all going to play a role. But I would say that when it comes to like my shirt sizing, I will normally get something that's like a four or a six or a, a small or a medium. But when it comes to sports bras, like let's say Lululemon, for example, just because that's a really popular brand, even though my size might be considered a four or a six, I often had to go to a 10 or a 12 for the bra to fit me comfortably and not be squeezing in on me because I'm a big proponent, you know, of comfort. Um, so if I'm having a hard time breathing, I automatically feel so claustrophobic and I have a hard time being able to do anything with not being able to breathe, obviously. Well, I think that's fair. Yeah. I mean, so you said you're normally a four or a six and you would have to go up to a 10 or a 12. Yeah. Jeez, OP, you're jacked, bro. I, what can I say? <laughs> I mean, some hammers for lats. Thank you. <laughs> well, I Is mean, that PD program? Yeah, I think so. So what are, what are some of the benefits or reasons that you train lats? Um, the visual appearance, of course. I'm, I, I'm, I'm not gonna not gonna lie about that. Uh, but also, I would say for just posture overall. I know with a lot of muscles, we have mentioned things when it comes to posture, but I think it's so so important because posture not only is going to be how you present, but there's so much within posture that comes down to function, where functionality and the visual appearance do go hand in hand with a lot of things. And I have been working on some different things with my posture and just recognizing like, oh, I slouch into this side a little bit more when I'm working on something or I dig into this side. And that then makes it hard for me to do different exercises because I'm feeling like this pinching, I'm feeling different problems, which can be fixed by being able to have better posture, which then in turn will make doing those exercises better and or easier. Where do you feel like you slouch the most? Like when do you get in the worst sitting position? Uh, I mean, at my desk, obviously. <laughs> I feel like mine is when I'm driving. I always lean towards the center console. Well, I did notice that because I felt like my hips were like completely lifted yeah. as I was driving the other day. But I will say like a lot of times without realizing it, I will take like my, um, my left elbow and I'll like put it on my chair or whatever. And then I realized well, I'm just that, like actually, yeah. always leaning to the side. So you'll see me, I mean, especially recently, I've been working a lot on like making sure I'm not like leaning into one side or not. Mine's the car. Like I really have to resituate myself constantly because it's such a habit that I've made for so long. Well, that's also why I like recline my seat a little bit because then that allows me to like keep my spine. Oh <laughs> yeah. Is that why you recline the seat? Whereas, like, Is that why? If it's too upright that I feel like it's like a lot of work to <laughs> keep my body upright and then I just start slouching over or slouching to the side. One of my biggest qualms with, with Sue guys is For that- For no reason, it doesn't affect when you. When we first started dating, she would recline the seat back so far she could kick her left foot out the, if she was driving, she could kick her left foot out the window and I mean, still be driving. Right say? foot, obviously on the gas and then she's I, got the left the foot out the window. doesn't even need to be reclined for me to do that, honestly. <laughs> but I do like a reclined seat a little bit more than the average person. So if you're ever in the car with Sue, just know that you can't sit behind and her. I, no, because she's my got chair, it. She's got it horizontal, basically. No, but <laughs> I also bring my chair up like as close as possible. Like there's times where I still am driving and it's like my car, like no one sat in it. And I'm like, 
does this need to go up a little closer? And it's like, this is as close as the seat gets. That's probably one of the more uncomfortable things with driving is like my knee, like I need to have like my leg extended when I'm pressing the pedals. If my knee is bent, I feel really uncomfortable. Yeah, probably because you're like running into the dash. Yeah, probably. Okay, what are my benefits and reasons that I train lats? So lats were one of the first muscle groups that I fell absolutely in love with. Mm -hmm. Like when I first started bodybuilding, working out, whatever you want to call it, the three muscle groups that I was obscenely obsessed with was quads, lats, and forearms. Now, with my early on program design, what muscle groups did I probably miss the most on? Quads, lats, <laughs> and forearms kind of by, I don't know, forearms kind of worked out, mm -hmm. but definitely lats and definitely quads. And so I love the look of lats, like well-developed back is one of the coolest things to me because of the complexity and because of the diversity from a visual perspective, it is the coolest thing to me. Um, so from an appearance standpoint, I love that, but also from a function, it's, it's going to impact so many of the things that I enjoy doing. If I was to get into golf, mm -hmm. lats are going to be a big part of that. Mm -hmm. And so if you were going to get into like chopping wood, I don't know about that in the part future. Of that. It would be a, a part of that. Mm -hmm. It was a big part of my baseball. Yeah. And it's in part, like I have an if imbalance. If you shoveled a lot, like if you got into construction or like landscaping, that would be a big part of it too. Again, things I'm not going to do. Okay. Well, just saying just if you were. If I was. Those would be a big part of it. I understand. Okay. But with my with my lats, I swung left-handed. So I'm pulling towards the right side all the mm -hmm. time. So I have an imbalance to my right lat relative to my left because of how many repetitions I swung that bat. And that's something that I'm still working on to this day to get to a place of um, symmetry. Mm-hmm. And it's something like within swimming where you mentioned it earlier, but I was a big butterfly gal. Big and butterfly that, gal. I mean, that is just continuously using those lats, really pull those out in front of you. And that was a big part of it. Can you give them another demonstration? No, I don't have like enough space. Okay. I didn't think so. <laughs> another benefit that I like within lats is just what it takes within core stability. And this is a visual I use for clients a lot when I'm recording videos for them. I will show of with no weight just in my office, here's me moving in the pattern that would be for my lats. And I'm like, you don't see my lat actually being engaged. And then I'll be like, all right, now wait until I engage my core. As soon as I engage my core, they start to see the lat pop out, even without me like having any weight or anything. And I really like to show that visual because it's so easy to think, I'm doing what the video shows. I'm moving my arm from this angle to this angle. But when it comes to lats, if you don't have a strong core, then it's going to feel kind of junky in some different areas. It's going to feel like you're going to have to use your scapula a lot to like pull against it. It's going to feel like you might be using your bicep or your shoulder a lot as you're going through the movement. And that's, again, what you get a lot of, I don't feel my lats. And I think that it forces me to have so much more core stability and being able to really engage that, which I like because I like the challenge of like, I can't just move through the motions with this movement. I have to be very considerate. And oftentimes when I'm training, if I'm like, I don't really feel my lats, I take a few seconds to make sure my breathing is aligned. Then I go through some like deep core engagement. Then I go back into the movement. I'm like, oh, there it is. I love that. And I would also say that if you are someone who is working to improve their lat training, having soreness through your abdomen after the session is good feedback for you that you're creating more stability for your lats to work more properly. Mm -hmm. And since you mentioned of like the lats being such a big like muscle group as a whole, and it's going to take a lot of power, that's also going to contribute to your other upper body movements as a whole and being able to improve in those too. Absolutely. So since we're on the topic of training hard mm -hmm. and it being such a complex muscle group, what are some of the more common mistakes that you see people make when training lats? Not bracing their core <laughs> properly. I will go ahead and just start with that. But I would say that range of motion is a really tricky one for people when it comes to lats whether it's too little range of motion or too much range of motion, I would say that some people end up, it's hard to say, but I would say oftentimes I see people trying to do too much range of motion because they think it's going to give them more like output to it. And they'll do a lot of 
like being able to protract their shoulder. Let's say if they're doing like a lat pull down, they'll protract their shoulder at the top and then bring it back down. And they might feel like they're getting more of a stretch in the lat, but really you're just having your scapula retract uh, and or protract, and then you're having to retract it again to pull your arm back down. And so I think that being able to understand what the active range of motion is, is huge because that's another thing within taking too much range of motion. If someone's doing a rowing or a pulling movement, they might bring their elbow way past their body and they're thinking, oh, I might be getting so much more lat here, but it's, hey, let's stop around that midline of the body and we'll be getting as much as we can out out of it instead of just doing extra movement to do it. Yeah. I think a a good way to verbally put it is that as we're doing a a horizontal motion, if we were to continue to pull and then we start to see that upper arm go up, that's going to be a sign that we're pulling now away from the lat. And so it's something as we're driving that upper arm down that we're going to pull back as far as we can keep basically that upper arm down. And then as soon as we were to pull so far back that that arm now starts to elevate, that's where we're going to be like, okay, we're getting outside of the active range of motion. Mm -hmm. Um, And when we talk about that range of motion, if we think more about the movement of the upper arm, relative to the protraction or retraction of the scapula, I think that this simplifies things a little bit more. Because if we get too focused on how is our upper back functioning for something that is going to be more dependent on how the arm is moving, it it makes things a little bit more complicated. And so thinking of the depression, if you're doing a pull down, right? And we are driving that upper arm down, we're continuing to drive that upper arm down. We're going to get the most out of that iliac lat by continuing to drive that um, arm down relative to if I was trying to go into retraction, I'm not going to get much more lat out of that necessarily. I'm going to now be recruiting more of my upper back in that particular movement. Is having more musculature in a movement being involved wrong? Not necessarily, but in the context of our conversation today and it being more biased towards lats, that's what we're talking about. Mm Mm-hmm. What would you say is a common training mistake that you see? I think exercise selection. Um, Exercise selection in the sense that they see pieces of equipment in the gym. And I, you know, it's fair to make this assumption. It's a lat pull down machine. Okay. Well, whatever piece is on this piece of equipment, I imagine it's going to be training lats, which is not true. Um, It's going to have, you know, to to some degree, right? I shouldn't say not true, but it is uh, to some degree going to be training lats, but we can change the uh, attachment for us to be able to target the lats better. Uh, Same things goes for like a chest supported horizontal row. It may say like a a lat horizontal row or a, it may just have lat in the name of the machine. And I think that it misleads people because it's going to come down to the execution of how they're performing the exercise. That's going to allow for them to target more of their lats relative to their upper back or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. That was going to kind of be in tandem with the next thing I said which was just going to be your grip as a whole, where because of what you're mentioning within like what we think of of a lat pull down machine is normally that long bar that's kind of bent at the end, where if we just go ahead and grab that and we have that overhand grip or even underhand, that's not going to put us in the place that we're biasing the lats as much as possible because it attaches to the upper arm. We need to be able to have our hands in a neutral position. So think about your palms facing one another so that you can lower that upper arm and really be able to get that full lat involved because of the shape and what we're actually trying to hit, where that is extremely misleading because everyone thinks lat pull down, that's what I'm working. But oftentimes you're not at all hitting your lats in that movement. So you you are going to get a portion of the lat. This is where some of the research gets misconstrued is that you're still like at that wider pull down, you're going to get the iliac fibers of the lat, the ones that are going to run more vertically that are going to be attaching at the iliac crest. uh, We talked about on the hip there. Mm -hmm. So because you are still depressing the upper arm, you're going to get those lat fibers. And so if the sensors and and how they're testing are placed there, they're going to get a lot of lat involvement, but it's still going to be more dependent on the protraction and retraction of the upper back being that they're going to have more focus on the upper back in that particular Mm -hmm. exercise size. And it's going to get less and less lat as you start to have more momentum and swinging in that exercise, which is very common when people are doing a wide grip lat pull down. 
Now, within talking about exercise selection, I would I'm curious on your thoughts on this. On if you see people thinking like, oh, I just have to do things vertically versus being able to have a mixture of vertical and horizontal movements. Do you see that within exercise selection? I do. I think that there's a, a lack of variety to exercise selection. I think that with lat training, this is an area where we are still early in understanding how we can best train the lats because of how large the muscle is and how we can move the body to be able to further lengthen the tissue. And I don't think that we're in the place quite yet that we know exactly how to train the lats at the longest lengths because of how it wraps around the rib cage, because of how many origin, um, origins there are for the tissue. And so there needs to be variety because of those different lat angles that we had talked about for the fibers themselves. We talked about the horizontal, we talked about the 45 degree, and we talked about more of those vertical fibers. And so having some different variations of, of how you're pulling horizontally and how you're pulling vertically, I think can be tremendously helpful to your lat training um, in general. So I, I think that variety needs to be in place and it doesn't need to be just like one or two of you know, movements of like, I have a pull down and then I have a horizontal row. It's like, how, you know, how are we setting these things up? How are we setting up our body? Um, those different things. And how much does body positioning play into that to ensure that we're hitting? Cause like you said, with having that like general lat pull down bar, that longer bar, we are still getting some of those lat fibers, um, that are running along the side here. But if we're thinking about being able to hit our lats fully, are we still gonna just be like sitting up and down for every movement or does our body positioning play a role in that? So we'll want to have the contracted core. We're gonna have more of a, a stable positioning here. If we go into thoracic extension and raise our chest, we're going to put ourselves in a place where we're not going to best target the lats. Again, are you still gonna get some lats? Yes. Is it the best position? Probably not. And so have Having more stability through the core is going to be a big piece of the puzzle. And then we have, you know, I, this is where the research is continuing to expand into. Can we rotate? Can we have the arm coming across our body? Can we, you know, all these different variations and getting into the weeds more so of can we train lats better? I think that we're still in the stage of figuring that out. And so I don't want to say for certain of like, this is good, this is bad. I think that we're in a place where we're still learning. Yeah. I think one thing that we can say is the aspect that lining up the tissue with the resistance, where if I am in a place where let's take like the bent over row, for example, uh, if I don't bend over and I just have the weight out in front of me, I'm not going to be necessarily targeting my lats because the tissue isn't lined up with the resistance of the gravity. And so that is why we bend over to go ahead and do a single arm row is because we want to ensure that the tissue is lined up with that resistance. And so while there is still continuing research, being able to just think of, okay, now I have the visual of what the lat looks like. I want to think about how I'm going to line up the resistance, whether that be from a cable, a dumbbell, a barbell, a machine, whatever it may be, with the muscle that I'm trying to work. Sure. And I think that with a single arm row, using as the example, uh, it's going to be more upper back than lat with the single arm row, but it's still going to be involving those upper uh, division fibers that we had talked about that are going to run more horizontally. Are there any other common training mistakes that we haven't hit yet? We talked a little bit about... Um, too much momentum. Um, I think that that would be something to just be mindful of. Momentum can be a useful tool, um, but it's something that you don't want to overly do because now we're just dealing with, um, you know, generating force through that momentum relative to actually utilizing the tissue to generate the force that we need. Now, what about as far as how close your arm needs to be to your body? I would say keeping them close to your sides, especially you go back and we you think about the origin and the insertion. How are we going to get those two points as close together as possible? We want to keep the upper arm running along our sides. Now, being really rigid of like it has to be scraping along our sides. I don't think that that's necessary. But being tight in that area, I think, is important. Are you sick and tired of your glutes not growing? turning around in the mirror and seeing a board for a booty. I've been coaching for nearly a decade, helping thousands of women reach their goals. The most common goal, grow my glutes. Women in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and even 60s, able to grow their glutes with the guidance of my training programs. And for all this time, I've kept my best glute growth secrets only for my one-on-one -on -one clients. And that changes today. 
we just released our 12-week glute growth program in the PD training app. It is a four-day program with exercise and volume adjustments every three weeks. You can easily access the program through our app and track every single workout. Each exercise will have a detailed video teaching you exactly how to perform each and every movement. And guess what? I am no longer gatekeeping. I'm sharing every single one of my best glute growth secrets inside this program because you are awesome and I want you to have this program. I'm going to give you $25 off, making it a fraction of what you spent at Starbucks this past month. Use code POD. The link to purchase will be in the description. Now let's get back to the show. Now let's go ahead and talk about different exercises that are your faves when it comes to training lats. So all of my lat training movements are unilateral, I think. I don't really enjoy training back with bilateral movements. I can't think of one exercise that I enjoy more that's bilateral than any of my unilateral movements. Uh, I think with some of my horizontal rowing variations that I can do some bilateral work, but with all my vertical work, I much prefer single arm relative to, to bilateral. You know, I can agree with that. I do like bilateral for the fact of the time saving aspect. I really that don't can think go it's that much it. of a difference in time. Okay, we can agree to disagree. <laughs> but I will say that being able to do things single arm, I feel like has helped me with engagement and ensuring that I'm just moving my body correctly. And it's even something I've implemented a lot within clients if they are dealing with anything with their scapula or any issues with um, like their rib cage being too far forward, being able to really move things to all pulling movements, being single arm has helped a ton to not like further exacerbate issues that they are dealing with. Okay. Um, so to say my favorite, let's, we'll, we'll categorize them as vertical. So my favorite all time is the Nautilus plate loaded vertical pull down. I actually found this. I know dedicated podcast listeners know that this is a piece that I have wanted for our gym for some time. And I found one that is in Florida for $500 today. Oh, wow. I haven't even told you yet. Oh, yeah, this is nice. Found to it me. for $500. Now, I have nowhere to put it. I, I have thought about this all morning. Looks like we're going to get a storage unit. I don't know. Uh, it's two, $2 per mile traveled. So I haven't done the math on that quite yet, but for $500, this is a steal. Uh, this piece of equipment is my favorite. And I also should say the piece that I found is not the plate loaded version. It's the pin oh. loaded. So it's, it's kind of different. Yeah. It's like, do I hold out for the plate loaded, even though they don't exist anymore, I'd have to find it used. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But the Nautilus plate loaded pull down is my number one. Mm -hmm. What's your number one vertical pull? Oh, I would probably say just like a, like the single arm cable pull down. Do you like doing it in the, um, like the actual pull down machine, like it's it's fixed vertically, or do you like to have a setup where you're on a knee or you have you on know, a knee for sure? Okay, and then you're you're doing you're using an adjustable cable. Yeah. So then the arm is more like in front of you rather than like directly above you. Correct. I can agree with that. I like mm -hmm. that. Um, what's another vertical movement for lats? It's it's at this point you don't have a whole lot of other yeah. options. Horizontally, you've got some differences in height of the cable being set or whatever the case may be. But with vertical, you've got really the two pieces that we just said. Yeah. And then just bilateral, right. horizontal lat pull down in the actual like lat pull down I will, area. I will say the bilateral neutral grip vertical pull down is one of the more challenging exercises for your core. Yeah. The stability that you have to generate for your core in that particular movement, especially as you go into sets of like six, very challenging. Mm -hmm. Like if you're, if you want to strengthen your core and, oh, and be able hard. to stabilize better, that's a movement that's really going to challenge you. All right. Let's go into horizontal then. Horizontal, another single arm variation. I like the cable. <clears throat> I like the cable to be a little bit higher. And the reason that I say that is because we talked about the upper arm needing to be depressed or down. And so by having that cable a little bit higher, it allows for us to bias the lats more as well as having a slight hinge forward with our upper body is going to help as well. So both of those things in combination are stellar when it comes to, to horizontal rows. Yeah, I like doing the horizontal and the cable bilateral with both arms. I'm trying to think of, of a favorite machine. I love the 
Or what are you about to say? I was going to say I love the hammer strength. Oh, you love the I, I love the hammer strength too. Yeah. That wasn't the one that I was going to say. And it's hilarious because we have it in, yeah. in the garage. I know what one you're going to say. What is it? You're going to say that um, pin loaded uh, prime one. Pin loaded prime one. As the chest support? The, no, that'd be plate. The, I mean, the one that I'm thinking of is okay. plate loaded. Um, but the, yeah, the plate loaded, chest supported. <laughs> prime horizontal row okay. i think is is probably my favorite i also you know going back to the nautilus pieces r.i.p to all these beautiful back training pieces that no longer exist um they had a horizontal plate loaded piece that was amazing uh, what's the one that they had at lifetime that was what? it oh, okay I couldn't yeah. remember if they had the exact one or not. Oh my gosh. I if I could get those two pieces, I'm done with lat training. I love those Do two pieces. Do you like the like extreme row or like the seal row from Prime? I'm trying to remember what that is. They had it at KHG and you would like literally like oh, lay oh, down oh. on it. It was plate loaded. It's so that one's tough because one, as you get heavier, you just can't breathe. Yeah. <laughs> like it, the, the pad is just pushing into your sternum so much that yeah. it's like I'm going to suffocate here and finish this set, um, or, you know, or die. Mm -hmm. So that's, I, I enjoy that piece. I think that, uh, at in one, they have rigged that piece up. They've, you know, added some wood pieces and changed some things around to make it even better. Because I also think you're limited on range of motion in that particular piece, unless you're, you know, a specific height or whatever. Uh, I just think that it doesn't fit every person the best. Mm -hmm. I do like a single arm bent over row. Um, and then I also, what are your thoughts on like the pullover? So the pullover is going to be one where I, I don't think that it's a, a real viable option out like as one of my favorites, mm -hmm. right? It's not going to be fantastic for lats. It's not going to be fantastic for chest. Are you going to get some stimulation in both of those muscle groups to some degree? And if it's the only thing that we have available to us to give us a little bit of variety within our lat training, then, you know, that is what it is. But if I'm picking my favorite exercises, it's not going to fall into that camp. All right. So have you picked all your favorites so far then? I, I think so. I mean, I'm so simple with my back training. Like yeah. it really is. Well, there is, really isn't a ton of variety because it's the motion that you're doing. Yeah. And, and the variety is going to come from machines. Yeah. Like the variety of setting up your, your body positioning, where the cable um, is going to be coming from. That's where, you know, the, the variety is going to stem from. If you're someone who only has dumbbells available to you, you're in a real rough spot when it comes to back training because yeah. you don't have a ton of options. And I, I just had a client take off with his, uh, he's got, I think two or three kiddos and his wife, and they are doing like this cross country. Um, they're in like a, what are those called? Sprinter like, vans. Like a sprinter van. And then he got like dumbbells and a pull-up bar and all this to still keep up with his training as they travel. And I was telling him, I'm like, this, the hardest part of this is going to be getting your lat training, you know, still in place. Like pull-ups are going to be a decent option for you. We've got to be very particular with how we're executing. Um, and then we just have the dumbbell variations of the rows. So now that we have gone over all of the best exercises to have in place, what are some cues to help really nail down that form? Man, I feel like we've already, we've said all of them, I feel like. <laughs> we have talked about a lot of them, uh, about what it looks like for just your body positioning and making sure that your core is engaged and um, making sure that you're starting the movement with your upper arm and not your scapula, because that's a big thing when I'm looking at exercise execution videos. I'll point out to clients, I'm like, look at your initiation because it's coming from like your shoulder and your scapula instead of really being able to move that upper arm down. And one thing I will state with that is if you've been training with not having the right intent or just initiation with it, you likely will have to go down and wait to get it nailed down. And that can be very hard of like, well, I can lift this much doing it this way, but you always want to think about what is getting the most tension on the muscle so that I'm actually engaging what I'm trying to. Yes, I would say when you're filming yourself and you're trying to get a video of your lat training, pay very close attention to how the shoulder is moving at the start of the exercise and then how is that shoulder moving at the end of the exercise. So if we're looking at the lats, it's going to be something where the, the shoulder is going to be pretty steady from the beginning. And then we're going to have some level of retraction as we get towards the end range of the motion. Um, but if you are initiating and seeing that shrugging up, you see the movement of the shoulder before the movement of the upper arm, you're probably having a little bit of greater recruitment towards the upper back and, and not having as much tension as you can have placed on your lats. Mm -hmm. 
And I would say another thing is we did talk about how like that straight bar, you can still hit some of your lats, but being able to just pick the right attachment of making sure it's wide enough and being able to allow your wrists to have some movement there instead of being so fixed in everything that they do. Do you have a, an example, like a, a V-grip for? Yeah, V-grip is something where that's like extremely narrow. I don't know anyone that that would be able to truly target their lats being See, that narrow. I do think that some smaller frame females, like it's not the best. They have to best. be very small. Well, I mean, those people exist. I, I, I know. I said I don't know many people that like could if, use that. If you are using the V-grip and you pull it towards your chest and you can feel your, your elbows driving outward, it's too narrow for you. Yeah. If you find yourself in a place where you are somehow so blessed that you pull that V-grip back and your arms are staying just straight back and running along your sides, you can keep using the V-grip. <laughs> Very few. I, I've had some clients. It works. Well, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, now, is there anything that you have to take certain application in mind when it comes to clients as a whole when it comes to lat training? Certain application. What do you mean? Uh, let's say someone who might be a competitor. Yeah, I think that um, with lat training, it's going to be something that some divisions need a lot of it and some divisions don't need any of it. So you've got to be cognizant of that when it comes to the athlete within any of the divisions. Are there divisions or what would those divisions be? So the divisions that would need a lot of lats are going to be all the male divisions and then uh, basically every female division outside of wellness and bikini. And so for the bikini athletes, it is, I mean, with bikini athletes in general, you're walking a fine line of adding muscle tissue to their upper body, regardless, whether it be, whether it be chest, whether it be delts, whether it be upper back, it would be lats. You've got to be very, very careful with not putting on too much tissue there because they're really highlighting this as we've seen within the judging in years past. So bikini is one where you have to be more careful with it. And you have someone like, um, was it, was it Issa? Mm -hmm. that she was more so flaring her lats in her front pose. I don't know, maybe like two or three years ago. And they were, they were docking her points because yeah, Daraja too. Yeah. They were docking her points because that was not the look that they were wanting to have. Mm -hmm. But the thing for both of them by flaring their lats, it made their waist, as we've talked about, s appear smaller than what it was, even though both of their waist are tiny, tiny yeah. already, it really shrunk down their waist even more. And so I know that for just, you know, I, I don't know Daraja personally, but I do know know that she had to really pull back on her upper body training after that time frame, And it's really changed her, her look. And it's been, I mean, she's placed well over the last couple of years, so it's been good for her. But I would say that wellness and bikini are the two that we have to be very, very, um, careful with when it comes to lat density and, and changing that in their physique, but a division like figure, for example, pour it you on. You need it. Yeah, you need it. We're going to get it. Yeah, get it. Absolutely. I mean, any of the divisions where they have to pull their hair to get out of the way, yeah. let those lats fly. <laughs> Exactly. So are you ready for some uh, questions about lats from the listeners? I am. All right. How do you isolate lats? How do you isolate lats? I think this is an interesting one because if we think about isolation, we're thinking about by themselves. And there's going to be few scenarios in which the lat is working by itself. Like the upper back is going to be contributing to some degree, the biceps, the rear delts, these are all going to be contributing in these different exercises uh, that we would be performing. And so we're more so trying to get into a position that allows for the lats to be the primary mover, right? And so how we've talked about these different exercises today and the vertical pull down, the horizontal row, these movements allow for us to have a greater bias of the tension towards the target muscle group that we're trying to train. So I would say, do the exercise we just talked about, and that's going to be the best isolation that you could have for that tissue. Do pull-ups build lats? Yeah. I mean, we talked about the, it, it depends on how wide of a grip we're going to have of the overall involvement. If we've got a really wide grip to the pull-up, we're going to have less involvement as we get tighter and more around our, our shoulder width. And we're maybe more neutral with our, our grip placement. We're going to have more involvement of the lats. Is it going to be this incredibly lat building exercise? I think there's better options, but certainly you're going to get lats involved in the pull-up. Do deadlifts hit lats? So we talked about the extension of the arm and the arm being pulled back. When you are at the bottom of a deadlift, 
that's going to be part of the action is pulling that bar closer to your leg, right? So the lats are going to be involved in that as well as the stability to posture and those different aspects. Is it going to be an exercise where it's like, well, because of that particular portion of the deadlift that I should put this on my back day? Probably not. Now, more power to you if you want to put it on your back day. Like if it works out for your structure to put your deadlifts on your back day, go for it. But it's not going to be something that's this big lat driving growth exercise. I feel like I mostly see that with a lot of like larger male bodybuilders that say they do a lot within deadlifts or it's like a favorite lat exercise for them. And I'm just guessing here, uh, educated guess, but I would say part of it is because um, of first the amount of weight that they are lifting when it comes to those deadlifts. So that's playing a role in how much their lats are involved, but also just exercise variation of there's only so many movement patterns you can do for lats. Being able to have in a little bit of something different allows you to just feel like, okay, I'm doing something different for lats to be able to engage them. Yeah. And I also think that I've never seen someone with a small back who can deadlift 600 pounds. Max tuning. Nah, uh, you know, can he lift, has he done 600 pounds? I don't pounds? know, five something, well, that was, six That was such a confident statement Should to I like not up? know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Max. <laughs> um, are lats the hardest muscle group to grow? The hardest muscle group to grow? Um, you know, for me personally, it's gonna be calves. <laughs> <laughs> oh I would say for a majority of people, lats are gonna be the most challenging mm -hmm. just because of all the things we talked about throughout the entirety of the episode. <laughs> and how do you train lats at home? Already touched on it. <laughs> how much how much equipment do you have? <laughs> <laughs> how much equipment do you have? Uh, can you do you have heavy enough bands to potentially set up some different row or pull down variations? That's gonna be an option there. If you only have dumbbells, we're in a tough spot. But um, we do have like different row variations that we can try and make happen. Um, but I would say if you've got bands, you can set up kind of uh, pull like uh, pull downs or horizontal rows, and then you've got the dumbbells. And then if you have a, a pull up bar, that'll help too. All right. And then do lats grow better with high reps? Lats grow better with high reps. Um, I think that with the challenge of stability, I would say that lats are going to grow better with more moderate to low rep because of the the weight aspect, the stability, all those different factors, and then the amount of involvement that other muscle groups can play as we get into a more fatigue state. So mm -hmm. if we were to go into, and, and what I consider to be high rep is going to be 15 to 30. And so if we were to be going above 15 repetitions, I think that fatigue is going to set in and we're going to start changing our body positioning. We're going to recruit more of our upper back. We're going to recruit more of our bicep and take away some of that tension that we want to allocate towards our lats. So I would say as my own opinion, they're going to grow better with more low to moderate repetition. Awesome. Well, that's all the questions that I have. Is there any other lat advice you want to give to the people? Hmm. Lat advice. I think right now that we're going through this transition period of learning more about lat training and people are trying to also learn in that process. And so they are sacrificing load to try and put themselves in these unorthodox positions to try and, and train the lat more in a lengthened position per se. I think that a majority of people are going to benefit much more of just being really good at a single arm cable pull down get really good at that. Like I've seen some of the, and I, I don't want to equate this to a situation of like not carrying muscle tissue, carrying muscle tissue. Cause it's like, that's just a pissing contest that's ever, you know, going on for forever. But I would encourage a majority of individuals don't need to be so specific within their lat training and, and really just need to focus on getting great at a vertical pull and a horizontal pull at the end of the day. Well, awesome. We will have the cheat sheet for the lat muscle group down in the show notes or in the description box, depending on where you're listening or watching this. And make sure that you share this with a friend that also needs huge lats so that they understand it a little bit better. We also have a playlist of all of our favorite lat movements and how to perform them. So you make sure that you're getting the most bang for your buck. But we hope you're enjoying the muscle series and we'll catch you in the next one.